Well, all right, let's get our Bibles out and let's open them up to uh, John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 20. About five years ago, I was uh, sitting in my office. It was interesting to be back in that office uh, last Friday, sitting there looking out the window. And at one sense, it felt like I'd never left. Um, uh, the other sense, it's like, this church is very different than it was five years ago, but five years ago, I was sitting there uh, trying to determine what would the next series be uh, that we would look at as a church. And uh, one of my dreams in life was to preach the Gospel of John. I'd never preached the Gospel of John and wanted to do that. And then the Lord opened up a day uh, away, and off we went to GCC for four and a half years. And, and so here we are back, and I'm going to fulfill, I trust, the dream that the Lord allowed me to have uh, to preach through the Gospel of John. And so uh, that's what we're going to be doing over the next uh, ministry year. And uh, I'll give you a, a, a lot more information about this book next week. Uh, but for this week, just to say that the gospel was written by John, who was the brother of James, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, they were called. Uh, John also wrote the books 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Um, this book is written towards the end of his life. It was before he wrote the book of Revelation, but towards the end of his life. And so most of the rest of the New Testament is already written before the gospel of John is written. Um, the Gospel of John is an incredible book for anyone who wants to understand about Jesus. It often uses a starting point with unbelievers and, and new believers. Um, the word believe or some form of the word believe appears almost a hundred times in this book. And so our series entitled, is entitled Believe. Because if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to go home and this week read the Gospel of John and ask these kinds of questions. Who was Jesus? What did he do? And what should I do as a result? Uh, that's true for all of us. I've been reading and rereading this book and just mesmerized and encouraged by the work of Jesus Christ and how John wants to make sure we have this clear picture of who our Savior Jesus Christ is. When you're preaching and you're going to preach a new book, one of the questions you always ask is, so what is the, what's the key verse in this book? Or, or what is the book about? What is its purpose? And, and that's what we're going to take a look at today. This will be an introductory message uh, to the series. But in John 20, 30, and 31, unlike some other books of the Bible where you have to kind of discover what the book was for, Thankfully, John, he just tells us. He makes it absolutely, perfectly clear what the book is about. So let's stand together. We want to honor God as we read his word and we see what this book is all about. John 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Lord, we hold in our hands your most precious word. John, the son of thunder, wrote this down so that we might believe. And I pray, God, in the journey of our message today, in our journey through this book, through this ministry year, you would strengthen our faith. You would strengthen our resolve. You would strengthen our passion to be followers of Jesus Christ. I pray that as the word of this book is preached, that, Father, people who've never trusted Jesus Christ would come to the place of understanding how awesome our Savior is, how amazing the work is he has done, and they will put their trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Lord, so give us ears to hear your word this morning, minds to understand, but then, Lord, would you give us faith. Faith, Father, to live these things out for the glory of our Savior, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, you can take your seats. I entitled this message, Belief, So What's the Big Deal? So what's the big deal? 
Well, he mentions believing about a hundred times, so for him, it was a big deal. Uh, if I was to say what the big idea of this message is, it's believing is that your, your eternity hangs in the balance. Your eternity hangs in the balance. So this is not just some side thing or some thing that we can think about or an area for us to grow in. Uh, believing determines where you're going to spend your eternity. And so when he comes, when John writes, he says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He's like, this is so foundational. This is so core. And you're like, well, I've already trusted Jesus, so what do I need this for? We need to be reminded of this every day. We need to be living our faith out based on what Jesus Christ has accomplished for it. May we never forget the work that Christ has done, and that by faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, we have been saved. So let's jump into the text. He says, these things, in verse uh, 31, these things are written. These things are written. I'm going to take a little bit of time this morning to make our way through as an introduction to the book. What were some of those things that were written? These things are written that you might believe, so they must be important. They must be things we should take note of. Uh, if you take a look at the context, and if you know me, you know, context is king in the scripture. In the verses before, Jesus Christ has just risen from the dead. He has appeared um, to Mary Magdalene. He has appeared to the disciples. And now Jesus has just been with Thomas. Eight days later, his disciples, in verse 80, uh, 26 says, uh, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve. Do not disbelieve, but believe and Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. So what were some of these things? I was just kind of going through in my mind, what are some of the key verses, the verses that I think about when I think about this gospel and that, that remind me of the work of Jesus Christ? And the first one we're going to look at next week in depth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who was Jesus Christ claiming to be? Who was John saying Jesus was? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And then the most famous verse in the entire Bible, for God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In John 3.30, my wife's life verse, but a statement by John the Baptist, he, Jesus Christ, must increase, I must decrease. A verse of call to discipleship in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then there's the working of the Holy Spirit as we see it in this book. In John 14, 15, and 16, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And in John 16, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And then as we go through the book in chapter 13, we see the picture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. How many of us need to learn a lesson about humility in washing others' feet? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who's about to go to the cross, takes off his towel, he bends down, and he washes their feet, and 
In my arrogance and in my pride sometimes, I'm so caught up in who I am. And Jesus was about washing feet. In John chapter 17, we see the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. He's about to go to the cross. And he's crying out to the Father. And he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you study through the book of John, and you actually see it in our text, um, because it talks about this sign. Um, there are, depends who you read, six or seven signs. We said this was a sign. This was a sign. And uh, we're going to look at six of them, only because everybody agrees there were six. And so uh, we will take a look at them as we go through the text. But signs that demonstrated who Jesus Christ was. Um, there was a sign of him turning water to wine in, in chapter 2. There's a sign of the healing of the nobleman's son. There's a sign of the healing of the lame man in chapter 5. There's a sign of the feeding of the multitude. There's a sign of the healing of the blind man. There's a sign of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus, all of the works of Jesus that John's recorded are there. Why? So that we might believe. So that we might believe. That we might have this foundation of understanding who truly Jesus was and why it was so important that he came and what he accomplished. And there's the signs. And then lastly, there's the I am statements of Jesus. Seven times Jesus said, I am. In John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Bread satisfies physical hunger, but Jesus satisfies the spiritual longing in every Man, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. In John 8, it says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in John 9, 5, it says, As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. In a world that's filled with darkness, we see it around us every single day. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the answer to the darkness. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. In John 10, 7 and 9, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I said to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the protector of the sheep. What a great hope we have that our salvation and its security is not based on what we accomplish, but it's accomplished in what Jesus Christ has done, and He is the door. He is the great protector. I am the door. Then Jesus said, I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11 to 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. This speaks of the sacrificial love of Jesus. He does not leave us uncared for. And then Jesus says in John 11, I am John 11, I am the resurrection and the life in verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Death brought despair, but the ultimate resurrection of Jesus Christ brings life to those who believe. And then probably the most famous one, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6 and 7. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you'd have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen me. All roads do not lead to heaven. All roads do not lead to Christ. 
There are not many paths to God. There's one through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then the last I am, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and at verse, at chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the wine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We prayed back in the room before the service today, and we talked about this in the prayer. It's like, Holy Spirit, please do what only you can do in this place. We want to be abiding in the vine, but we understand fruitfulness comes from abiding in the vine, and unless God works in us and through us, nothing will be accomplished in our church. Nothing will be accomplished in the junior high, the senior high, the children's ministry, the men's ministry, the women's ministry, the small group ministries, in any of our, nothing will be accomplished for eternity unless the Holy Spirit does the work and that comes by people who are abiding in Jesus Christ. So why is this all so important? Well, these seven statements, if said by anyone else, would be blasphemy. And it was part of the reason the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. They knew exactly who he was claiming to be. And what he was claiming in this book is what we want to see as we consider uh, the word of God, as we consider these things are written, these kinds of things, so that you might believe. You might believe and be saved. You might believe and find courage. You might believe and have uh, um, uh, an encouragement to move forward in a difficult time. These things are written that you might believe. So let's look at two or three things real quick. Here's the first one. Believe because of who he is. Believe because of who he is. This is, we're going to see this all through the book, but in this text it says that you're, these, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. These things are written so that you can see where salvation comes from. You can have the confidence of knowing your sins are forgiven because of who Jesus is. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus, Jehovah, is the Christ. He is the anointed one. That's what Christ means. He is the anointed one. He is the one who God poured his blessing onto. He is the one who has come uh, for our salvation. He is the Messiah. We're going to learn in John, from John the Baptist in a couple of weeks. Uh, why did John come and what was his purpose? And at the end of it all for John the Baptist, it was, hey, hey, look at that guy over there. He's baptizing more people than, than I am. Why? Because he must increase. I must decrease. God, help me to learn that in my life. When I get a little uppity about myself, and I think I'm all that, that I would remember that he must increase and I must decrease. Maybe there's something that happened in your workplace this week or happened in your family or maybe on the way to church today and, and it was like, you were on the throne. You were the king of your castle. And you lost sight of he must increase and I must decrease a long time ago. Um, he's Christ, the anointed one, the son of God. I'm looking forward to looking into that as we look at John 1.1 1, 1 tomorrow. Jesus Christ was the satisfaction of, of God's wrath. The wrath poured out on the world because of sin. The wrath poured out that separates us. The wrath poured out that gives us no hope. And Jesus Christ was the wrath. He was the, he was the one who satisfied the wrath of God. He met God's requirement because a payment was required that none of us could make. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The whole Old Testament, the law is all pointing out and just really brings us to the place of we are broken people and we have no hope. And they had all of these blood sacrifices to, to, as a picture of what Jesus Christ would come and ultimately do. He would be the perfect sacrifice. He would be the one who would stand in our place before God. He was the one who suffered. And so we have this great picture of who Jesus Christ is. He was the one who met the requirement of the law. He was the one who satisfied the wrath of God. And there I am, needy hopeless, filled with sin, 
and blind. Believe because of who Jesus Christ is and was. Here's the next thing. Believe because of your great need. Believe because of your great need. Look what it says in the text. But these things are written that you might believe. That you might believe. You might believe. Why? Because you have a great need. But is it that you might believe? Um, Dennis, thank you for your kind words about my life growing up. I sounded like a little bit of an angel. I thought, man, he was a really good kid. He didn't give you half of it, let me tell you for sure. Um, I remember, the, I, I remember the day that I was in church, little, little church that we went to at the time, and I heard a message as an eight-year-old kid about preparing to go on a trip. And that's what triggered in my mind that God's spirit worked in my life and I went home and I asked my mom for some more information about what's that trip about. And she explained that he was talking about how you go to heaven. What does that mean to have eternal life? It's what he says right in the text that you might have eternal life. And, and that night I trusted Jesus Christ as my savior. I am so thankful to my mom. I'm so thankful to that church. But the reality of faith is that faith is a personal thing. It's a you thing. You don't get to heaven based on the faith of your family. If, 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 if someone said to you, how do you know you're going to heaven? You go, well, my mom and dad, it's a wrong answer to the question. Your mom and dad might have been faithful. Mine were. The churches I've gone to have been faithful, and I'm thankful to God for each one of them. But the reality of faith is a decision that you make where you put your trust in Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to that. But he says that you might believe. I think of the impact of my parents. I think of the impact of friends and church, and that's all important. I, I think of the reality of 2 Corinthians 5.20, where it says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's not lost on me that we carry a great responsibility of, as followers of Jesus Christ, but I can't save anybody, and you can't save anybody. God's spirit works, and people need to make a personal decision. Have you, you, trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? The faith of your parents is not going to get you into heaven. The teaching of your church is not going to get you into heaven. What will is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. These things are written that you, that you what? That you may believe. That you may believe. Okay, so what's this believing thing then? hundred times it appears. And what's it talking about? It's not just talking about a, a, an understanding or a mental ascent. It goes way behind a mental ascent. Let me, let me paint you a couple pictures here. Um, this year, Sue and I, in my role with GCC, had the privilege to fly out west. I had the privilege to fly many times. And I understand a little bit about lift. I understand about wings on airplanes. I understand about airspeed. I understand why they extend the wing out so the air going over the top makes the plane rise and all the rest of it. And, and I can believe all that. But eventually you have to get on the airplane. That's the picture of belief. That's the picture of believing. You can believe about it, but until you get on the plane, it's not really belief. It's assent. I got a couple of pictures to put up on the screen. Uh, let's put the first one up here. Sue and I were actually at the Jays game yesterday. Somebody uh, gifted us some tickets. It was amazing. We sat down in that stadium and looked up at those crazy people who are hanging off of the CN Tower. And I'm like, the, the only good thing was if they ever fell, they weren't going to land inside the stadium. I wouldn't have seen what happened to them, right? But we're looking up at these crazy people who are up there, and it just reminded me of, do I believe that that harness is strong enough to hold that guy or those people? Do I believe the clips are, do I believe the safety thing? Or do I believe it? Yeah. Am I getting to do it? Never. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine, a number of years ago, his wife gifted him. I think she was trying to get rid of him, actually, but <laughs> she gifted him that opera. He phoned me and said, hey, do you want to go with me? And I said, I don't even have to pray about that. The answer is no. I am never doing that. Okay? Well, do you believe? He didn't say this is me. Do you believe? I believe all about it, but I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Because I could believe. I have mental assent, but I didn't have belief that took me to the next step of transferring my trust and getting into a harness and hooking to. I'm not doing that. Okay? Another picture. 
Uh, this is a picture of the uh, skywalk down in um, Arizona over the Grand Canyon. Yeah, I, there are other pictures we could have used. That's like 1,100 or so. I don't know how many feet. Too many feet above the bottom. For when it collapses and I'm on it, it's way too high, right? And so I look at it. There's people out there. Do I believe it will hold me up? Do I believe it? Well, I, I see people are out there and I think it's okay. But the guy who designed it must have been crazy because he made the floor glass, and some of you are like, yeah, so what's the big deal? I'm never going on that thing. <laughs> do I believe that it could hold me up? Yeah, do I think it's the, yeah, I'm not getting on it. I'm not transferring my trust. I'm not putting my hope in that, okay? So the text says, these things are written that you may believe. Believe. Not just mental assent. Not just I believe all about those things, but I'm actually willing to put my trust into those things. We're going to see that in just a moment in the text. So why unbelief? Well, things like fear. I made a list. Fear. Fear can keep you like, I, I don't even like going up a ladder. I climb on the chair to change the light bulb. And it's like, Sue, hold me so I don't fall. I fear. I don't. Um, ignorance. I don't understand the principle. Some of you are like, why are you such a chicken? Like, that harness is so safe. Nobody's ever falling off that. I don't care. I'm not going. It's, uh, ignorance. Um, inexperience, I've never seen it. Um, I've never been a part of it. Um, here's, here, I've had no example of it. Um, in Mark 9, 23 and 24, it says, Jesus said to him, this is a dad who Jesus heals the son, and he said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes, he says. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Now, I don't even want help in my unbelief to hang off the CN Tower because I'm just quite satisfied with my unbelief there, okay? But, but in our spiritual sense, some of you are here today and maybe you've trusted Jesus Christ and you need to be reading through the Gospel of John and say, okay, I understand, I understand. Help my unbelief. Take me from a mental ascent of understanding about things to trusting. Sometimes we have unbelief because our eyes are blind. You just can't see it. Sometimes we have unbelief because we won't see it. You have what you have in your life. You like what you have in your life. And you realize that transferring your trust and putting your hope in Jesus Christ is going to cost you everything. And your life is going to turn upside down. And quite frankly, you're happy to have mental assent, but you really don't want to have true faith in Jesus Christ. You're in good company. In James 2, 19, it says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Ultimately, this unbelief comes from pride. Well, belief in what? I went through a whole litany of scriptures and truths from God's word. Um, how about this a belief that you're a sinner separated from God? John is writing so that you can know that Christ came. He satisfied God's wrath. He's the only one who could be the sacrifice. He died. He rose again. The gospel of John demonstrate that Jesus was who he said he was. He did what he said he would do. Believe. Believe. Because you have a great need. And maybe today you need to transfer your trust and your hope to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Now here's the last thing. Believe because of what is accomplished. Believe because of what is accomplished. It's interesting, there's a little bit of a different word that's used in the, at the end of this verse, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, you might have all the knowledge, you might have it all, and then he goes on and he says, and that by believing... And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Uh, by believing means we're transferring our trust. We're transferring our hope. It's not just about knowing all the things that Jesus did. There are millions of people in the world who go to church on Easter and remember the work of Jesus Christ. And oh yeah, he died on the cross and he rose again. And they've never put their trust in Jesus Christ. It's a, and by believing and by transferring your trust Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved, how through faith, not through knowledge, not through, I understand the principles, not through mental assent, uh, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it's a gift from God. It's a result of work so that no one would boast. In Acts 4, 12 it says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. By believing, we are saved. If you're here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ, I believe that's the story of the, the vast majority of people in the room, then, then you need to be rejoicing in how awesome the work of Jesus Christ was for you. What he did for you. What he accomplished from you. How he brought you to that place where you put your trust, you put your faith, you made that decision, you have a responsibility, you trusted Jesus Christ, and now you have hope. We're going to see it in just a second. You have hope that the world does not have and it does not understand. And we need to live more and more out of that. I need to live more and more out of that. Focus back on what Jesus has accomplished. But if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And it's in the transfer of your trust from your hope in yourself or whatever else your hope has been in in the days gone by and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You've seen me, if you've been around here, you've seen me do this so many times. When you get to heaven and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? The answer is, because I'm with him. Because of what Jesus did. Because of what he accomplished. Believe you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And transfer your trust in your hope of from yourself in your, it's really just pride, but in what I'm, I'm going to be good enough. I'll stand before God. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. And put your faith in Jesus Christ alone today and you'll be saved. Well, what's the outcome of all of that? Look at the end of the verse. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, by, by you believing, by you getting in the harness and leaning off the tower, by you doing that walk out on it, moving beyond mental ascent to actual faith in Jesus Christ, and by believing, you have what? You will have life in his name. Life that starts today. Eternal life that begins the moment you trust Jesus. For me, it was when I was eight years old. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Eternal life begins at that point. Oh, it's going to get way better, believe me. But, but that's when our life begins. And so we have this new life in him. You may have life in his name. And so the journey and the hardship and the discord that comes to all of us, we have a different hope. We have a different vision. We're looking forward to something far greater. And that's what's offered in this book. That's why John said, I've written all this. I've written all this so that you can believe. You believe in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you can have eternal life. Well, so what? I know some of you have been waiting for me to say that. So what? Your eternity hangs in the balance. The eternity of our kids and our grandkids hangs in the balance of this truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. And so do you believe? And by believing, do you have eternal life? If not, today is the day of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you are a believer, if you have believed, what difference will this awesome finished work of Christ make in your life? He gave his life so you can have life that needs to be surrendered for his glory. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. I thank you for these two verses. 
where John just lays out so clearly what he was passionate about, what was important to him, what was critical. He wrote, these things are written that you might have life. Father, I pray that you would take your word in the power of your spirit and accomplish what needs to be accomplished in each one of us for the fame of our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. 